So uh, this is actually a totally unexpected honor uh, that Chuck is here today. I know many of you heard Chuck in the past two conferences. Um, but unfortunately, Chuck wasn't able to attend this conference because he had a huge trial coming up, I believe, that was scheduled for next week and obviously needed to have the time to prepare for it. And so there have been a few, many actually, touching moments this week. Uh, one of them was when after Tristan Barosio sang his song in front of all of us, I went up to him and I said, Tristan, I would give anything to have your brain to be able to sing like that. And if you could have just seen his face just light up. So that was a touching moment. Um, and another touching moment was when I got the email from Chuck Monday night telling me that actually the case had settled and how terribly he felt that he couldn't uh, commit to coming until now. And so uh, I immediately, I think I was sitting up here or something, I texted Lindsay. I said, Lindsay, guess what? <laughs> we got to find a way to work Chuck in. And so uh, Chuck came here on his own dime on very short notice. So you can imagine what kind of an airfare that was. Um, by history, I first met up with Chuck, how many years? Five, six years ago, something like that? These people are waiting for dinner. OK, we'll cut to the chase. <laughs> I've got a whole page here I wanted to read about you to everybody. He's a hell of a guy. He's a, the only attorney that I know that I absolutely adore and admire. And he is an advocate for children like yours. So with no further ado, get your ass up here and talk. <laughs> Let me, uh... Oh no, I think I lost your talk. Darn. That's fine. They, they've heard it before anyway. Oops, there you go. All right. <laughs> all right. Um, good to see. No, you don't need my reading no, glasses. I'm all right. Good to see you guys again. Um, you, can you all hear me? I don't like to stand too close to the microphone, so you can probably hear me anyway. Um, oh, I'm getting the signal back there that they can't hear me on the video. All right. Um, is that better? Does that work? Okay, great. Um, all right, so we're, we're here to talk about um, emergency protocols, um, but I, I, I did want to apologize, first of all, for the suit. Um, I, 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 you know that's sort of like the uniform for lawyers, and you saw that Kevin had one too. And um, I, I had to laugh because I took a walk out on the, the, by the water um, in my suit, and uh, there was a homeless guy who saw me, and he said, are, are you a Mormon missionary? <laughs> so I, I, I guess I must look pretty respectable. Um, but when, when a homeless he, guy. <laughs> but when he found out I wasn't going to try to save him, um, I, I, I found a new secret. If, you, if you're bothered by a homeless person when you're trying to get some peace, um, they have very little interest in talking about emergency protocols. <laughs> so, you know, for whatever, whatever it's worth. Um, I, I brought this cartoon because um, I, I always have to say that I, I'm a little ambivalent about speaking at medical meetings. I do it all the time. But the, 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 problem, the, the, the problem is that you know, I, I do litigation. And when you represent people in litigation, it's sort of adversarial. And I don't like this process to ever have a hint of, of, of adversarial in it. Um, but there's one thing I think that we all can agree on, and that's um, advocacy for these kids. And so this is one area where I feel like we all have the same thing. This emergency protocols are something I feel very strongly about that really benefit these children. And so I'm comfortable talking about that subject because I don't think it's principally adversarial. Um, before we talk about protocols, though, I did want to comment on a couple of things that were legally related that you guys had talked about earlier. Now, one of them we, I was talking about with Jessica that is, is, um, is the special needs trust thing. Almost all of the cases that I handle involve kids who ultimately end up getting a lot of money in a medical legal settlement and they um, always get special needs trusts. And so I wanted, to, I wanted to sort of put in my two cents about special needs trusts. Uh, Kevin is obviously a world expert on them, um, but what I wanted to say is there's absolutely no reason why you would not get a special needs trust. First of all, there's no other trust, in my opinion, that you should consider for your kids. Um, because you, there's just absolutely no reason not to retain your child's eligibility for benefits. So I, I just didn't feel from Kevin the sort of 
strong, the sort of strong advocacy for that that I wanted to hear, because he, he, he and I agree on that, we talked about it, there's no reason to think about any other trust for your child, because only special needs trusts are going to assure that your child remains eligible for all of the different things that, 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 that they may want. Um, because when you put a money, money in a special needs trust, it's designed by the legislature specifically to keep your child eligible. So y if you're going to do a trust, you do a special needs trust. And what Jessica and I were talking about even further is, I, I think that everyone should, should, should have one. Everyone who has a child with special needs should establish a special needs trust. Why do I say that? Even if you're not rich, even if your child is not rich, what, what is the downside to developing a special needs trust? All right, it's a little aggravation. You might have to pay a lawyer a little bit of money to make one. But what's the upside? The upside is, and Jessica, what was the expression that we were using out in the hallway? Well, we were saying that, uh, I forgot exactly how it oh, Come on, <laughs> come on, Kevin, Co Kevin Costner, Kevin Costner. <laughs> If you build it, they will come. If you have an aunt or an uncle or a sister or a neighbor or a, a philanthropic doctor, whatever you know, a godmother, grandparents, people who care about your child, if you have a special needs trust, that's where they can give money to that child anytime they want and there's no repercussions whatsoever to the child. It can only benefit the child. And I believe that if you have a special needs trust and it's set up and everyone knows about it, then it makes it more likely that people in that child's life will give money. And I don't care if it's $15 or $15,000, people, people will, I've, I've seen these kids out in the hallway, I represent these kids, people fall in love with these kids. And I mean, that's just the universal thing, you know, that I, I, you know, I walk in and I think people care about me and then I realize they really just care about the kids, you know, and they just want me to get out of the way. And, and, and that's the magic that they have. Um, you know, there's a friend of mine has a clinic out in Strasburg, Pennsylvania for kids with special needs in the Amish and Mennonite community. And they call that clinic the Clinic for Special Children. And they call that clinic the Clinic for Special Children because they truly believe that they are special children and that they believe that they are God's gift. And so many people share that belief. And I believe if you have a special needs trust set up for your kid, you will be surprised at what will happen in response to that. So I, I, there's no downside. If you create one and nothing happens, then nothing happens. There's no, there's no downside to doing it. And there's a potential upside that's very significant. So that's my pitch for it, um, for whatever it's worth. Um, the, the other thing I wanted to say was about, um, about uh, the, um, you know, the problem in schools when you're not getting what you want. Um, you know, I heard people talking about paid advocates, um, which, you know, I'm all in support of if you have the right advocate. But when you guys are going in for one of these IEPs, um, which, you know, I, I'll, I'll be the first to tell you, I've never been to an IEP. I've had lots of clients that have had one, but I've never been to one of those meetings. So I'm the last person here to tell you what happens in an IEP. Um, but I do have a lot of clients who have them, and I do have a lot of clients who have trouble getting what they want in school, whether it's music therapy or something even more significant to them and more fundamental. And one of the things I want you to remember when you have problems is that there are attorneys out there who specialize in education cases. And there is, you know, the, the, you know, a lot of times families are reluctant to go to attorneys because they think of attorney, and it's, 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 it's just what you were saying to me earlier is that you know attorneys are like bulldogs, and you don't want to introduce that concept into your IEP. You don't want that dynamic. You don't want you don't want to be adversarial necessarily, and you're afraid if you bring in an attorney, you're going to lose control, and it's going to become adversarial. And I just want to remind you that there are attorneys that specialize in education law, and if they're good, they know better than to make the mistakes that you're talking about and what you're worried about. And they do it all the time, and they know exactly how to go into these processes to make them effective. And I don't think that, you know, certainly you don't have to pull out, a, you know, an attorney every time you have a problem with an IEP. But period.
periodically there are school districts that really do the wrong thing for children and they don't provide services that ought to be provided. And you know, when they do that and you hire an attorney, if they're wrong, I believe, I mean I've never done it myself um, because I would be the worst person for that because I probably would be too adversarial. Um, but the, 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 um, I believe that the school district is required to pay these attorneys if they succeed in a claim. Maybe somebody here knows that, but that's what I was told by the, you know, the education attorneys that I have hooked people up with and, you know, my client situations. And so just keep it in, you know, in the back of your mind that that's a possibility that you can do that if you need it. I mean, if it's something that's there. And, and it, but it's like, it's sort of like Kevin. Did you notice how specialized Kevin is? You know, you guys think about lawyers and you think, well, they're a lawyer. Well, lawyers are like doctors. I mean, Dr. Grossfeld is a super specialist. And that means not just that he's super, but that he's super specialized. And, and, and you know, you think about it, he's not just a pediatrician, he's not just a cardiologist, he's a pediatric cardiologist. And even in pediatric cardiology, he has things that he specializes in, that he focuses on, that he's a world expert on. And, and, and lawyers are, are, are like that. You can't just go to a corner lawyer or go ask your neighbor or your friend for a lawyer and expect them to do well for you in terms of estate planning for your special needs child. And you can't go to a lawyer um, you know, and just say, well, I need help at school with my IEP. Because most lawyers aren't going to know anything about it. And they're going to be terrible. They're going to be terrible. Just because they're a lawyer doesn't mean they know anything. Uh, trust me. I can tell you that's for sure. And so what you need is to find somebody who really specializes. You need a pediatric cardiologist you know, of IEPs. And there are lawyers that are pediatric cardiologists of IEPs. But you have to find one. And the way to find one is to, is to you know, try, for, call me. I'll tell you. I mean, I can tell you who the lawyer is in Philadelphia. And she can tell you who the lawyer is in New Hampshire. Right? Or she can tell you who the lawyer is in California because they all hang together in a little clique of lawyers that, that do IEPs. And it's the same for trust lawyers like, like Kevin. There are people around the country like him that specialize in doing estate planning and special needs trusts for families like yours. You don't want to go to a general lawyer. You don't even want to go to a lawyer who's a trust and estates lawyer that doesn't have expertise in this. You want to go to a lawyer that specializes in what you need. And they are there, but you have to find them. And once you do, you will see the difference. And the way to do that is to find, you know, I mean, call Kevin. Now, Kevin, he can't really, Kevin can't really help you if you're from, you know, Georgia. Okay? I mean, he can, but, but the rules in Georgia are different, and he's not allowed to practice law in Georgia. I mean, you know, he, he's licensed in California. And, and so what he would do is connect you with somebody in Atlanta or Macon or wherever that has a specialty in what you need that he knows because if he's the director, president, you know, head enchilada of their national organization. So he'll know who the good person is in Georgia. Just like if you were at a children's hospital in Atlanta, you know, Dr. Grossfeld isn't going to be able to fly to Atlanta and treat your kid, but he, he probably knows who the pediatric cardiologist is there, and he certainly knows somebody who knows him, and he can tell you who the good person is. So I'm just saying that when you want these things, go find the right person to do it. Anyway, um, that, none of that has to do with emergency protocols. Um, emergency protocols, what is it? Um, I think you all know. I mean, maybe let me. Let's maybe we can cut this talk short. Maybe we can cut it to like 30 seconds. <laughs> do all of you guys have children with some sort? Do all of you have children or family members or somebody in your family with Jacobson syndrome? I'm in the right meeting. Okay. And and do all of the loved ones that you have who have Jacobson syndrome have their emergency protocol letter? Everyone. Well, the one that you drank. Yours. Yours. Oh, that. The bleeding one. Um, no. I, I, I'm, okay. Well, so, so you, you all know the value of emergency protocols. So, you know, we can, we can sort of skip through. I mean, that, that, is this is the protocol you're talking about? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, when you say you have it, what does that mean? That you have it. You mean that you know the website that you can obtain it on? Or do you actually have one? What is it? Okay, now we're talking. 
Because, because you know, this is the thing that I want to I want to emphasize, um, and I'm going to go out of order here. I have this all these slides, and you know, I'm just going to go out of order so we can talk about what matters to you, hopefully. Um, do, how many of you guys think? I just told uh, you know Paul that we you know I, I called the head of the emergency room at Children's Hospital in Philadelphia, and I said I'm going to give a talk about emergency protocols. And maybe I ought to ask you, since you're an emergency room physician, what the hell you think about them? You know, because you're an actual doctor and you, you're in an emergency room. So, what, you know, what do you think is important about this? And so we got to talking about it. And, you know, I said, you know, if, if someone comes in with an emergency protocol signed by their doctor, it, it, that's binding, right? I mean, it's just, that's binding. You know, and he's like, well, not really. Not really. What, what, what I think is binding on me is that I'm going to do what's ever in the best interest of that child. And I'm going, to, I'm going to exercise my medical judgment. And that protocol is important. And if I'm not going to follow that protocol, I better have a damn good reason. But I'm going to tell you right now, I don't view that protocol as binding on me. It's a piece of information that I think is important that I'm going to use. But I don't, when you use the word binding, I don't agree with that. And that's not what we teach our residents at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And, and so, you know, when we talk about protocols today, I want you to think about what it is that you're going to be doing with that protocol when you go into the hospital if you need it. Because it, it, it isn't like, you know, you hand it to them and then they mechanistically just follow the protocol. They're going to think about your child's case and they're going to try to think about what the right thing to do is in that situation. And the protocol is just going to be a piece of information. And so if the protocol is sitting on a website and you show it to them on a computer, that's one thing. But if you have a protocol that's signed by your local doctor, that's dated recently, that is individualized, that says, you know, your child's name on it and what's unique about your child, that protocol is going to have a lot more likelihood of success in terms of dictating that person's care than if it's something that you can show them on a website. So, you know, that I, if, there, if there's nothing else in this, in this, you know, that I really want, I really want to talk about, um, it's that. You guys all know more about Paris Trousseau syndrome than I, I do because I only know about it every two years when I read about it before I come here. Um, but I, but I, but I mean, I, I do know enough to know about, I do know enough about Paris Trousseau syndrome to know that it fits what I consider to be the classic protocol for a trap of a rare disease. And this is why, right? The risk for bleeding persists independent of a normalized platelet count. That's what I want to focus on, right? I took this fancy picture. How do you like that, huh? Good for a that's a platelet or platelets. I don't know whether that's one platelet or more than one platelet. <laughs> but it's one of the, it's, it's either one or more platelets. <laughs> um, this is the trap right here. So when, as a lawyer, what I look at, when I think about when medical malpractice cases happen with kids with special needs, with kids with rare disorders, the reason they happen every time is when there's a trap. And this is the trap for kids with Jacobson syndrome. The trap is that your kid shows up in an emergency room and he has a minor bleed, or he just had surgery, or something's going on that puts him at a risk for bleeding. And a doctor who's a real smart doctor, who knows that he's a lot smarter than you, and a lot smarter than everyone else in the room, in fact, he's the smartest person in the room, um, he sees that this child's platelet count is normal. So when the overreacting mother says, you know, I'm a little concerned because he has Paris Trousseau syndrome, and even though you know, you know, you think he looks normal, he he has a really big risk of bleeding, and the mom is really upset, and the doctor's like, "Calm down, calm down, calm down. I got his platelet count, and it's fine." That's the trap. That's what happens, and the doctor's right. He's right about every kid he's seen for the last six months. Just not this kid. So that's why we have this in the protocol. If I were going to change this protocol again, I would write in there something about this trap. E e even more than that, I would write, hey, just because the kid has a normal platelet count, that doesn't mean that he's not going to have a serious bleed, a life-threatening bleed. So if you think it does, you're wrong. <laughs> that's the trap. 
You guys may remember this case, but it bears repeating. This is a case that Dr. Grossfeld was an, uh, um, um, an expert in. I mean, if, are you guys familiar with this case? I'm familiar with this case. Um, this, is a case this is a case from Philadelphia, from my hometown. And Julia Summer, an 11-year-old girl with Jacobson syndrome, went to a hospital in Philadelphia, a very good hospital, the Crozier Chester Medical Center, a big academic medical center. And she was vomiting blood. And it turns out she had a two centimeter ulcer in her stomach that was bleeding. And the doctors there said, no big deal. No big deal. It's a rare disease. So most of the doctors you encounter are not going to know anything about this. It's, they tell me when I look it up that it's one in 100,000 kids. Is that statistic still true? One in 50,000 or something like that. Yeah. All right. Awfully rare. Dr. Google. <laughs> That's who you're going to be treating with. Without that protocol, that is your doctor. In the summer case, the defense lawyers were so concerned that they filed a motion, and this is a medical malpractice case now, the family sued the hospital because this, this little girl died. She bled out in that hospital. She was there for hours and bled out because they didn't give her a platelet transfusion. They were so, they were so concerned that when they were going to try the case, they filed a motion with the judge to ask the judge to bar the, the plaintiffs from telling the jury that the doctor went back to her office after she saw the patient and Googled the case so she could find out about Jacobson syndrome. Because the mom is an ICU nurse and she kept saying, you need to worry about this bleed. And the doctors were like, come on, you know, it's not that big a deal. And then she went back up to look up what the mom said and started Googling it. And they actually asked the court to not tell the jury that the doctor Googled the, the, the disease so she could understand how to treat it. Now, I, 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 look, I'm not judging the doctor for Googling the disease. I'm sure she didn't know anything about the disease. My point is that that's how, who's going to be treating your kid if you don't have a protocol and you don't have a phone number and you don't get the doctor on the phone with somebody that knows what they're doing. One of the things that I wanted to point out that we didn't talk about the last time is that your doctor's primary care physician, there's now a big push to educate pediatricians, family practice doctors, that they should be aware of the special needs of the kids that they have that have genetic disorders in their practice. Here's a toolkit for them to do just that. things that the toolkit talks about is obtain current emergency letter if applicable. That's all good. The bad news is that they list the disorders that you should have an emergency protocol with and although my spelling isn't that good, nowhere near J did I see Jacobson syndrome. It's a funny joke, but I bring it up because you guys have to be your own advocates. When you have a disease that's this rare, you have to be the advocates. You can't count on anyone else to do it for you. So some of the things that you know, what well, has to be in a protocol, but we talked about the top one, tailored to the patient. Don't just use the one that's on the system that's the generic one. Get your doctor, get Dr. Grossfeld, get somebody to tailor it to your child, to talk about your child. It will be a lot more effective if they see a protocol specifically tailored to Joe Smith or Maggie Jones or whoever the patient is because then the doctor will know that this is real. The other thing that I, I really encourage you to do, you know to get it signed by a doctor, you know to have paging numbers and instructions on there, make sure that it's dated because the one thing that doctors get freaked out about is protocols that aren't dated you know, recently because they know how much can change in a few years. And when they get a protocol that's dated January 5th, 2011, which is the one that's on your system, 
that freaks them out because it's a long time ago and they don't know what's different. So how frequently Well, like all things in the law, there is rarely a right answer. You know, the, the, the answer is whatever is reasonable. You know, whatever is a date that's going to make an impact on your on the emergency room doctor who sees it to think, well, this is this is this is right now. This isn't something. And we'll, you know, and I'll, and we'll, well, I'll talk about what I'll talk about that um, in a minute. Let, let me just go. Let me just go to another case. In our in our I'll call it our protocol since I did help draft it. Um, in our protocol, I still wish that we had something about this. And I, this is in some of the other protocols that I've done for some for the metabolic kids, the kids with metabolic disorders. Is I really would like the protocol signed by your doctor to have an endorsement of you, because you're going to be the one in the room with them. And 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 you know, I, I love doctors. I truly do. But doctors are just human beings, which means that they're all over the spectrum, you know. And some doctors just don't get it with parents. And I want there to be an endorsement of you as parents that says, hey, these people live with this every day. They go to conferences. They're with doctors all the time. They know this disease. They know their kid. Listen to them. <laughs> Listen to them. That's what I would like to see in the protocol. Some sort of endorsement of parents. Because again, what I want is a doctor to take it seriously. The problem in our cases is not that they're ordering too, too many tests. The problem is getting them to take it seriously and, and listen. I share these cases with you sort of as a reminder of what can happen to these kids. You know, I, all of these cases are my cases. Zoe Craig is a little girl who came to an emergency room with a different kind of disease, but with the same kind of thing. You had to do something fast, and you had to do it right. Her, her dad took her to the emergency room. He's a nice, polite guy who you know, was very respectful to doctors. He told the doctor, my daughter needs glucose. Um, they didn't give her glucose, and um, Zoe died. It was that simple. All she needed was glucose. <laughs> Can you send that to my wife? <laughs> oh, that's a typo. It's supposed to be dogs. Right? <laughs> um, we're, jo we're joking about this, but this is, this is really, you know, I don't think most of the parents here have this problem just from watching you guys over the course of the day, but you really do have to be assertive. You really do have to stand up in there you, or else you'll get steamrolled in some of these places. I like cartoons. This is a cartoon that reminds me of that. You've got to be strong. This is what I wanted to bring back to you. This is Emily. Um, this is a case that I worked on with Dr. Grossfeld. Um, it was a case that was one of the hardest fought cases that I've ever had, and it involved a protocol. Emily was a young girl, and this is what she looked like before she had her episode in the emergency room. She has a rare metabolic disorder, and once again, she needed glucose. Um, I carried this picture with me for three years in my wallet, which is why it looks like that, and I refused to take it out until I, f I felt that the hospital had accepted responsibility. Her parents came in with this protocol. They did not have a recent protocol. You asked me how, mu how, how, how much is recent? Well, I don't know, but her protocol was about three years old, signed by a doctor, and it wasn't dated within three years, and the parents were insecure about that. And so they printed the most recent protocol off their support group website. And this is it. And they wrote the doctor's name on the top of the form. And he's a famous guy. He's retired now, but in the metabolic world, he's a famous guy. And the doctor in the emergency room was not going to call that famous doctor on his cell phone at 1 in the morning. And so he didn't. Emily um, suffered severe brain damage as a result of that day in the emergency room for not getting glucose. She graduated from high school, um, but um, 
you know, she was a lot different person than she was the day that she walked in. And all she had to do was have glucose. And the doctor didn't give her glucose. And why didn't he give her glucose? Because her glucose level was in the normal range. Sound familiar? Her platelet level was in the normal range. Her glucose level was in the normal range. But the problem is, when you have very long chain acyl dehydrog CoA acyl dehydrogenase deficiency, it doesn't matter if your glucose is in the normal range. You can suffer a cardiac arrest like this. It's just like the platelet thing. It's a trap. The doctor saw that her glucose was in the normal range, and for the last 99 kids, that would have been okay, but not for this kid. And if he had followed the protocol, which said, 10% dextrose, the 10 milligrams of glucose per kilogram per minute, that wouldn't have happened. But he didn't follow the protocol because it was a protocol they printed off the internet and he thought it was, to put a term on it, bullshit. He thought, I'm not, gonna, I'm not following some piece of paper somebody printed off the internet. You know, I'm a doctor. I'm not, I don't get my information off the internet. The parents weren't assertive. The parents had the cell phone number, and that doctor answers his phone 24-7. I've called him many times, but he never got called that day. And that's what happened. I put this up here because it reminds me of another thing that has to do with, if I have five kids, and so I know what it's like dealing with kids. And you need you know, to be assertive with your kids as well. Because sometimes they don't want to carry a protocol. They don't want to know about a protocol. They don't want, you know, to do the things that they have to do. And, you know, you sort of have to make sure that they do. Because when they get older, and when they're with other people, and you're not always there, um, you know, you gotta make sure that they have the thing that they need to have. Um, this is what we talked about a little bit earlier. The emergency room doctor at Children's in Philadelphia, which is a, an amazing place, if you've probably never been there, but it's an amazing hospital. Um, he said that the thing about the protocol that he thought was most important is that it reminds doctors that time is of the essence. And he said that the second most important thing is that it reminds them that your specialist doesn't mind being called at one in the morning because his cell phone or her cell phone is sitting right on the piece of paper and it says, call me 24-7. And that's the thing that you sometimes need to get them over the hump to make that phone call. This is something new that I didn't talk about last time and I wanted to make sure that I, I ended with this piece of information. And, and by the way, um, if, if any of the stuff you want, Dr. Grossfeld has this PowerPoint. We can email it to you any, any, any time, so it's very easy. So nobody has to write notes. And not too long ago, the doctors at the American Academy of Pediatrics and the doctors at the American College of Emer Emergency Physicians that represents all of the emergency room doctors in the United States, they got together and they decided that one thing that they really wanted for kids who have chronic diseases and rare diseases is they wanted an electronic or emergency information form, an EIF. And this is the article, it was published simultaneously in Pediatrics and the flagship journal for emergency room doctors. And this is the form. I want you guys to know that there is this form exists. And this is a form that you can take. Now, the emergency protocol is one thing, but this is a little bit different. This is a much more comprehensive document. This doesn't just say if your child has a bleeding disorder, you know, you need to do this or you need to do that. This is something that covers a lot more of your child's history and gives a lot more information about, about your child to sort of cover whatever might happen. If they were in a car accident, or they fell out of a tree, or they got poisoned, or whatever crazy thing could happen to kids. If they're in an emergency room or they're in an ICU, you want them you want them to have access to your child's emergency information to all of their medical information and this is the form that they came up with and this 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 big committee of of all these doctors came up with that is available to you that you can print off the internet that you can get an electronic form and you can take it to your doctor and you can fill it out with your doctor and it gives Everything from immunizations, tetanus shots, to you know um, all the rare stuff that your kids might have that other kids wouldn't. 
most of the organizations that support this and the state organizations give a list of things. This is the list of places that they would like to see this, um, this, this, um, this emergency information form. So you can see your healthcare providers, your home, your car, work, purse, wallet, school. The, I didn't make this list up. This list makes sense, but this is the list that the doctors came up with where they would like to see this emergency information for your child so that they can be sure that they're going to get it and have access to it. I don't know how many of you guys know about Medical Alert, um, but it's pretty cool. And one of the things that they offer emergency, I can't read it now, but the emergency medical record right there, right across there, emergency medical record. So it's, it's right there. If you buy this service, and I don't, you know, look, I don't, make, I don't have stock in medical alert. I don't care. Um, but the great thing about it is, you know, if your kid has one of these things, then whoever sees them automatically can call that number, and they will, among other things, like getting your contact information, your cell phone, they will have access to this document. And they will also have access to this document, right? All the way up here, right? They get both. So emergency medical letters and the, and the, and the emergency information form. So, you know, it's something that you might want to consider is doing that, you know, is, is, going, is going on that medical alert thing. Um, because it's an easy way for people to have access to this information, um, you know, and it's not very, really very expensive at all. So, you know, for whatever, your consideration. Anyway, I, you know, if you guys have any questions, um, I probably can't answer them, um, but I can bullshit my way through it. <laughs> I appreciate it. And you know, it's a living document. And so when, if you guys, I mean, one of the great things about this group is that you're out there living in this world. And when things come up, if you learn something about that experience that you think is helpful, then you should pass it along. And the protocol letter can be amended at any time. And you know, that you should do that. It's, you know, when I used to work in a corporation, we would have a contract. And every time we got sued, you know, when we screwed up, then we changed the contract, to, you know, to get rid of that, you know. <laughs> and it really, the, you know, the, the contract was like a tree, you know, each ring was like a year that we lived through. <laughs> and the protocol letter should be like that. If you have an experience and, you know, you learn something from that and it's helpful, it, it maybe, maybe sepsis is an example of it, maybe it's not. But if it is, talk to Dr. Grossfeld and if it makes sense, then we put it in the version. And, you know, when we re-up these protocols, then it, it's contained in there. If I can add to that, Chuck, I haven't actually had a chance to talk to you about the fact that in the last literally couple of years, it's become very clear, just like what uh, he, what Jeremy alluded to, 
these children have, uh, many if not all these children have some form of immunodeficiency. And so we've been very fortunate to get involved now two great pediatric immunologists and they have already done some studies to begin to document that. And so their most recent recommendation at this conference is that all of the Jacobson syndrome children should have a comprehensive workup evaluation for their immune system. And so we were thinking if you're amenable to this that I think that would be a very important protocol or something to include in the protocol to uh, give the families leverage to go to their primary care doctor to get them the appropriate referral, which we can help them with similar kind of situation. I think. Yeah, I mean, and it's also, you know, it's also true, I mean, if some of you guys have coverage issues or things like that, if it's in the protocol, you know, it's a lot harder. It's a lot harder for them to, to argue about it. But yeah, I mean, uh, to me, that, that protocol should be constantly tinkered with and made better. You know, you, you just start with that and then when things come up like that, you know, put it in there. Absolutely. It's not a, I mean, I, that's, I think the only thing that's good about being a lawyer is that when you go through law school, you realize that lawyers don't know anything. And then you, you don't take it seriously anymore. You know, like other people are like, well, it's a, it's a protocol, we can't touch the protocol. You know, I mean, like, no, it's, it's a tool for you. You know, you, you change it and you make it better. It's not sacred. You know, it's something, it's only as good as it, it, as it helps your children. I just also had a comment about using the protocol. And, um, Are you allowed to talk here? <laughs> <laughs> we, um, we just came for simple stitches. We just went in for simple stitches. And you show it to them, and miraculously, we went from the end of the line to the front of the line in the emergency room. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the time issue, for sure. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good, good point. That it. Yeah. And my question is a concern I think you heard me earlier. At this point, <clears throat> excuse me. At this point, we have had a protocol at school in place. It was ignored because of other issues. Now, I am scared to send you back to school. What do, what should, should my next step be finding a lawyer at this point? I've tried almost everything I can think of and had advocates other than going legal. I think I, I, I think I heard about your story a little bit, and that, that's you're actually the person that made me make that comment about the lawyers, um, because I, I don't think that, that that bringing in an advocate as a lawyer is a is a is a is a reasonable thing to do, until you feel like your back is against the wall. But when you do feel that way, and something fundamental is being denied, which sounds like it is in your case. Then I think that you do have to you have to take that next step, and 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 again, you know, when it comes to lawyers, I I, I don't be afraid of lawyers. You know, you, you can find an education lawyer, and again, if you don't know one. I, I, I know that Catherine Reisman, who's the one I use in Philadelphia, she knows who her brothers and sisters are wherever it is that you live. She can find somebody. And then call them and ask them. Just talk to them. It's not like, you know, if you call up one of these lawyers. If they really cared about money, they wouldn't be an education lawyer. Okay? I mean, really. I mean, let's face it, you know, I, I, mean, it, it, you know, I mean, if Paul cared about money, he, would he be a pediatric cardiologist? You know, I mean, they, some people do things because they care about kids or they care about families. And these lawyers are like that. They care about these kids. That's why they do it. So it's not like you're going to call them up and they're going to give you a thousand dollar bill. Call them up and say, this is my situation, can you help me? Talk to them about your situation, and they'll be honest with you and tell you if they can help you or they can't. But you're, you know, it's not like you're gonna, you know, it's not, it's not like calling like a used car salesman or something, you know, you're not gonna walk out with a car. I mean, just don't be afraid to do it. Just call them up and say, and, and, and use names. If you say, if you say, Catherine Reisman, you know, or whoever it is, told me that I should call you, then at a minimum, they're going to be respectful and give you at least a little bit of time and, and try to help you out. If nothing else, is a courtesy to one of their colleagues. You know, so use that, use that resource. Thank you. We can't always be there for our kids, so I can't strongly advocate enough to say get the medical alert bracelets or something like that so that if you aren't there to advocate for your child, there is a way for the person who is caring for our children to know what the bleeding protocol is, what the numbers are with call, what the emergency contact numbers are, especially if your children are nonverbal like mine are, so that there's a way for them to get the care that they need. If time is of the essence, 
you cannot be there for whatever reason, make sure there's a way that caregivers can follow what your wishes are. I, I can't. I can't tell you how much I agree with that. I don't like to. I don't like to say too much about it because I don't want to sound like I'm selling for medical alert. But 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 doctors are trained to take that seriously. When they see that, they call that number. They take it very seriously and they get that information. So you know, it, it's a valuable service if you if you think that your kid could be in that situation. It's not that expensive either. I'm, Right. I mean, I, you know, look. I mean, it's it's money. I mean, it's you know, nobody wants to pay money when you don't have to. But that would be that would that, that would be where I would that would be where I would allocate myself. Um, I, I'm like I'm like super freaked out about stuff. Like now I'm I want I want to get like a GPS chip for my kid. <laughs> I do. I want a GPS. It's like I don't know if you watch 24, but I want to get it implanted in them. You know. Medic, medic alert has GPS units. I know. I know. I saw it. That it made me think of it when I read that. So anyway, you guys are great. If, if you don't, you know. Thank you.